Welcome to Manage Your Damn Money, where we trade in personal finance advice for entertaining conversations about money, and have heard whispers even Big Bird is being considered for a position in Trump's cabinet. Welcome to Manage Your Damn Money with Ben and Malcolm, where we trade in personal finance advice for entertaining conversations about money. I am joined, as I always am, by my wonderful friend and co-host, Mr. Malcolm Etheridge, licensed financial advisor. Sir, what is going on with you? Not a lot, man. You know, just happy that spring has sprung. It's starting to. Birds are chirping, fish is jumping, all that, all that good stuff. All those old man sayings, right. indeed. Um, really quickly, last night I was watching the WWE Mm -hmm. And it was the most comical thing I'd ever watched in quite some time to see the things that I used to watch as a kid. I was going to say, I hate to break it to you, but it's been the same show for the <laughs> last 20 years. I used to take it so seriously, like in elementary, going into junior high. It was like every, every after Thursday, whatever the Thursday So it wasn't was. fake to you back then? It wasn't really. It felt real. Like, it felt like this is real, like... The thing that trips me out now is, it's grown men in those crowds at WWE like, yeah. Right, it's you in those <laughs> crowds. <laughs> man, but it's it, you reliving your youth. Clearly. In the stands. It's just like these storylines, le legit, last night, Kane was wrestling. Wow. Wow. I'm like, why is Kane fighting John Cena? He needs a check. <laughs> That's, I mean, you know. Did you watch the 30 for 30 that ESPN did on uh, Ric Flair? Uh -uh, no, I did that not. That dude actually. was I can't remember exactly what the numbers were, but he yeah. was spending. He said something like a hundred thousand dollars a a month on cocaine alone. Like, <laughs> so it doesn't surprise it's me that living drug. right, living like they live, you need that check. So you constantly are wrestling yeah. thirty years past your prime just because you know, that's the only thing you're qualified to do at that point. They must not have a good retirement plan at the WWE. They didn't see The Rock laid out the plan. <laughs> you, okay, you John Cena. John Cena picked John up Cena's on John Cena's trying, but he's not getting paid $25 million a flick. That's true. Like, The Rock laid that plan out and executed it to a T. Indeed he They don't did. even call him The Rock anymore. He's Dwayne Johnson. <laughs> like, that is perfect, flawless execution of, of how to leverage that, uh, that platform. If you smell what The Rock is cooking. Right. Um, well, of course, some other news that happened recently. Uh, the Toys R Us founder, Charles Lazarus, died um, a little while ago. End of an era. End of an era, Like right? talking about WWF, right? <laughs> Toys R Us. Well, and not only did the, the founder die, the stores themselves died too, yeah. right? Like they announced that they were filing for Chapter 11 bankruptcy and like going to start shuttering their stores. Right. The most amazing part of that whole story to me, aside from the fact that the founder died, as, as you said to me when we were talking about it, he died of a broken heart. <laughs> but He was 94, by the way. Still, you know. That one little nudge of watching your life's work like disappear uh, <laughs> couldn't have been great for his heart. This is this is about to be really bad, but I'm gonna do it anyway. Is it ironic that his last name was Lazarus? Okay, see, I'm not <laughs> going there with you. Um, <laughs> uh, as we do on every show, it is now time for headlines. <laughs> Um, the headline for this show, Malcolm, is uh, young, single, and career-oriented. Uh, what are millennials willing to give up for their career? An interesting question. Um, this was actually a, a post by a company called CometFi. It's a student loan refinancing company, which explored millennials' relationship to career and romantic relationships, specifically the willingness of millennials to place one over the other. Uh, CometFi surveyed 364 single-employed millennials without children on what they would sacrifice for their career, the study revealed how many young people would stay single to focus on work and how many would break up with a significant other if it meant getting a promotion or a raise. Young Americans have more student loan debt today than any generation previously, which we always talk about on this show. Um, and more than two in five millennials in this particular survey were willing to end a relationship if it meant getting a significant or life changing promotion at work. So two out of five millennials were willing to end a relationship if they were going to get promoted at work, which is kind of interesting. Pretty significant. That's some, uh, at least two people out of five are a little bit janky. Um, <laughs> these transformative jobs were so important to millennials that the average respondent admitted they were willing to stay single for 11 years, delay marriage for seven years, and wait to have children for eight years if it meant scoring the right opportunities. 
Uh, thankfully, long-term relationships may not be an equal peril. Uh, more than half of the employed millennials would pass on a career opportunity that cost them an established partner, and 86% would move if their significant other were offered a better job. So, so that's the folks who are already in, in a relationships. relationship. Yeah, right yeah. so that means that they would keep the relationship more often than they would get rid of it. Um, and then it said when it came to making sacrifices for their career, most millennials would make major changes for their partner's professional aspirations too. In fact, 59% would move to another country to accommodate their partner's career move, which is, that's a big deal. Like moving to another country? Uh, that's pretty significant. Um, a big deal is putting it mildly. <laughs> it would have to be a really nice country where, uh, you know, I can continue or pick up wherever I was leaving off. I don't know what country would be, like, equivalent, nice enough for me to say, all right, cool. That's where I'm going. I think California is the furthest country <laughs> that I would be willing to entertain that conversation. That's funny. Um, the, art the story or the article went on to say, uh, and how much money would it take to delay these major milestones? Surprisingly little, uh, for $36,000 on average, more millennials would stay single longer, and for $37,000, they'd end a relationship completely, so only $1,000 more. Uh, Delane, That's the part that jumped out to me the most in this entire thing. I don't know who was polled here. $1,000 is enough <laughs> to make you make a life-altering decision like that. Indeed. In fact, if you get married, your salary jumps like double if you both work. But anyway... Um, delaying marriage or children was a more ex uh, expensive consideration, although for an average raise of six uh, of sixty four thousand dollars, I guess sixty four thousand dollars a year, millennials would put a pause on matrimony and for a raise or a promotion for sixty seven thousand um, dollars, they'd consider postponing having kids. So, so that you, makes more sense to me. It's because that's a higher level. Sixty seven sixty four thousand dollars is is enough to significantly change your way of living. Right. A thousand dollars isn't mm -hmm. enough to right. even like move to a better apartment. So I don't understand, you know. But you know, to each their own. So question: Has the has the thing that we experienced, and I'm kind of referencing like the Great Recession of 2008, mm -hmm. turned us into heartless, money hungry monsters? I think it might have. Okay. <laughs> I, I I think the culmination of a bunch of different market forces, like what, coming through a terrible job market as young, impressionable teenagers and even, you know, middle schoolers. Right. Watching your parents' lives being, you know, upended. completely upended yeah. by uh, the financial crisis and witnessing and realizing how much of that was tied to personal financial habits and so in, in a lot of cases poor personal financial habits right. and saying, you know what, I can do bad all by myself, <laughs> right? Like, so I think that has a lot to do with the decision-making process. But then also, you know, how much student debt am I carrying that's like a dark cloud looming right. over me that I'm looking at going with 67000 additional dollars. Right. I could be out of debt in 10 years. <laughs> as exaggerating, opposed to 17. <laughs> I could be out of this student loan debt exactly. a lot faster than if I had, you know, a, a, a partner who now we're doing a lot more uh, – life right. things that right. cost a lot more money true true would you put off would you put off like a new budding relationship opportunity if it meant a huge job opportunity in exchange absolutely <laughs> I, I i i can say that you, beyond a shadow of a doubt uh -huh. if i were single today uh -huh. and the job opportunity was like you know gotta move to florida right. gotta move to california whatever and There's women over i there. met somebody the next day right there's women there too. Like what you know, that's not even a conversation, you know, worth having. Uh -huh. So I absolutely. But the the one that amazed me was the folks that said, right. I'm in a serious relationship today. Right. But if you offer me the opportunity to make more money, well, uh, you know, now. we can negotiate. But that kind of goes back to the show that we had a few weeks ago. I can't even remember exactly when it was now, mm -hmm. where we were discussing the folks that uh live together only because of yeah. how high housing costs are. Absolutely. So then you got to challenge some of those relationships too. Like, are they really <laughs> built on, you know, them being together for the right reasons? Or, or financial is it that I'm with you because you helped me cover this rent <laughs> and otherwise I'd be out there in the streets? But baby, we got to make this work. Right. Um, so it's interesting. Why do you think it's a trade off between relationship and career goals? Like, why, is, why are those two things, at least in this scenario, put up against each other, which it feels like there's some truth to it. Well, one usually tends to take away from the other one, right? Like, I'll, I'll use an even simpler 
uh, example. You about to get us in trouble? Not us. I do. These are things that I say probably in my sleep at this point. <laughs> like, <laughs> but a, 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 an example to me is uh, exercise. Uh-huh. Like a lot of times, single people are the ones you see in the gym That's who true. are in there like an hour every right. single day. No matter what, rain or shine, six degrees outside, they're still coming in there. That's true. Whereas people who are in relationships are like, mm, I don't really have that kind of time. I'm going home <laughs> after work. I'm going to see my significant other, and we're going to hang out. And that's going to be it. Like right. that, I, I don't care as much as I did before, or I don't have the same level of free time that I did before. So something's got to give. Sorry, Jim. Like that. <laughs> I think it kind of goes the same way. Like yeah, mm-hmm. On a much bigger scale, right. your career gets a lot less of your free time if you know all right um so question before we go on to a, our first music break of the show um how progressive are you malcolm would you move to a different place outside of this like it, we'll, we'll call it even the states that you like okay because you don't like a whole lot of states but would you move somewhere else if your girlfriend or wife was moving for her career and it was like a huge job i think it depends on how much money we're talking about let's say like life-changing type money just for the sake of argument. Life-changing type you, money. You've like paid off your student loans. Above. Sure. So you don't have that to worry about. I but. still care about money. <laughs> like, I mean. <laughs> but let's just but call if it we're saying, you know, if we're saying, are we moving for an additional $10,000, no, no. Not no, to no. one of those 45 states that are on my list. <laughs> Are we talking six figures? Okay, well, then we definitely need to have a conversation about this, and the answer is probably yes, Okay, as long as it's not Mississippi, because I'm never <laughs> moving to Mississippi. However, that's kind of a, 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 an easy conversation to have. Right. Outside of the U.S., mm-hmm. a lot tougher, mm-hmm. regardless of the money. What, what do you think this is doing to our generation in terms of, like, this feels like we're going to be jaded, you know, millennials, and even those under the millennial generation, like, what is what is happening? Well, I mean, I think it's one of those things that time will have to right. tell right. out, and and by then it, it doesn't even matter anymore because <laughs> it's already happened to us. Right. But I think I think time will have to tell out, and part of the problem though is the conversation we keep having about wage growth right. being nil over right. the last ten years. I wouldn't have to worry so much, and I wouldn't have to be so money hungry right. if. I was at least earning a wage that was keeping pace with inflation, right? right? And I mean, me as in like the general, you know, 28, 29, 30 year old millennial that is actually established in their career some. Right. And, you know, still, I haven't seen wages rise, but my student loans are still there. Right. Housing prices are still going up, transportation and everything else. But I'm not getting paid any more than, you know, I would have in this same job 10 years ago. Right. I've got to be a lot more concerned and conscious about the dollars that are coming in because they, they don't go as far. That's true. So That's true. Well, they say, what's love got to do with it? <laughs> um, and I just want to remind people that you can always listen to past episodes of Manager Damn Money. You can simply search Manager Damn Money on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play, and Spotify. And of course, if you have a question that you want us to respond to or you'd like Malcolm to respond to on his Malcolm's Money Minute, send it to us, info at managerdamnmoney.com. Uh, you can also follow us on social media. Malcolm, what's your handle? Uh, at Malcolm on Money. And of course, I am at MYDM1. Um, you can also catch us on Facebook, facebook.com backslash managerdamnmoney. Uh, this is MYDM with Ben and Malcolm. We will be right back.
Welcome back to Manage Your Damn Money with Ben and Malcolm. Uh, we were got so into the conversation that we didn't even preview what we were talking about in this show. That's uh, right. Don't forgive us. <laughs> indeed. Uh, this show's episode, we're focusing on what you should be doing with your tax refund. Every year, some of us have the opportunity to get excited about getting money that is technically already ours. Uh, with the tax deadline here, April 15th, um, which is actually our company's launch anniversary i don't know if you knew that um, i did not know that yeah it's a kind of a slight fact um we're going to remind those who find themselves with an infusion of cash from their tax returns or anywhere else of what they need to be doing to set themselves up for success in the coming months uh it's important to remember malcolm tax refunds aren't exactly free money as we sometimes feel and i certainly felt when i was like a kid um, it's money you pay into the system to keep our state and federal governments running and a rebate, quote unquote, for having paid into that system if you have enough rebate qualifying characteristics or fall below certain income thresholds. Um, so, Malcolm, this is a year that I mean, this is a time of the year that's big for someone like you. Um, you're a licensed financial advisor. People start needing certain documents so they can file their taxes. Is that right? right? Is that right? That is unfortunately 100 <laughs> percent right. <laughs> Um, and I say unfortunately because a lot of times it's documents that have already been sent out <laughs> or documents that can easily easily be obtained online. Right. But we get requests where it's like, you know. Malcolm, 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 where, where's my uh? Or, or what happens is like January 10th, people start asking it's for tax early, documents. Before they've even been generated. And they don't, like, they're not even reasonably expected to be done before the end of January. Right. And they, I don't think they're even required to be out until like the end of March. Okay. But I'll get, start getting those emails mm -hmm. on like January 10th, 12th, uh -huh. something like that. And I'm like, why are you even filing your taxes this early? <laughs> like, but to, Stop being an on-time student. <laughs> to your point though, a lot of times folks who know that they're gonna get a return uh -huh. want it in there as fast as they can Absolutely. so that that money can come back to them as fast as it can. So. Absolutely, um, and to that effect, uh, we pulled a story that was nine smart ways to spend your tax refund. Uh, this was a piece by uh, Diana Yochim, uh, who writes for Nerd Wallet. It was in March, 2017. Uh, and like I said, it covered nine smart ways to spend your tax refund. Uh, the first thing on the list, buy your financial freedom and peace of mind. If you have a credit card debt, paying it off is the best investment you can make with your tax refund. Doing so delivers a guaranteed return on your money equal to the interest rate you are paying your lender, which is a good idea. Um, and then the next one on the list was sock money away for peace of mind. There's no better sleep aid than knowing you've got cash on hand to cover unexpected expenses uh, for whether it's flat tires, a flooded basement, um, and other income hampering events, a cut in work hours, disability, or a sudden job loss. Ideally, you should aim to have enough in your emergency fund to cover at least three months of paying living expenses. And I like it to be as many months as possible, whenever possible. Um, another one, Malcolm, was get a head start on major necessary expenses. So this is something that you actually kind of did in a different way. It didn't have to do with taxes. Um, but, no, because I owed money. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> but funding big ticket items on your 2017 shopping list, or in this case, 2018 shopping list. Um, so like... Meaning, if you know you're going to need a new car within the next, you know, two years, you might put this away, put the money away that you get back as like a down payment or right. initial stacking towards down payment of a new car or some other big ticket item that you might need. Um, then you could also seed fund your own investment efforts. Uh, want to know how to become a millionaire? Begin with one tax refund at a time. Invest that money and let it grow. And you'll put yourself on a path to obscene riches or a little bit more than money, a little bit more money than you had before. I like to point out real quick though, this is in like no particular order. Mm -hmm. So the one about uh, putting money to the side to start your investment efforts, right? Not on purpose, but it came after paying off credit cards. Right. That's a question that I get all the time from people who want to know, like, okay, I got this windfall, I got five thousand dollars all of a sudden, for example. Mm -hmm. Do you think I should put it in the market and invest it first, or pay off my credit cards? Right. I'm always of the opinion that the interest rate that you're going to pay on those credit cards uh -huh. is probably a lot higher than what you're going to see as a return in Absolutely. the market anytime soon. Mm -hmm. So you're much better off paying off the credit cards, avoiding those interest payments, 
versus chasing a return and then convincing yourself you're going to use your earnings to pay off more of the credit cards <laughs> or, you know, that kind of thing. That's just not how it works. It just doesn't happen that way. Right. Uh, another one on the list was uh, invest in your quote unquote human capital. Another tax refund maximizing strategy is to increase the value of your human capital. That is invest in yourself. Right. Uh, think about it. You are the biggest income producing asset. Your expertise, talent, experience, work ethic, and reputation bring delicious snacks to the office potlucks are all <laughs> part of what adds to, val to your value as an asset. And unlike stock market returns and interest rates, you can influence your own rate of return by improving your value in the working world, which is a really interesting point. I think that's probably the best return on your money out of all the ones on the list. You're literally in the process of investing in yourself, Malcolm. Yes. Uh, I don't think we've really talked about it. You're in school right now to- Unfortunately, yes. You you literally have flashcards on set. Right now. <laughs> and I was like, what are these little cards? Thanks in my for putting oh, me on they're flashcards. <laughs> he's, yeah. he's reading them off aloud before we got started on shooting today. I have an exam every weekend. That sounds awful. It is. But literally, I, you know. literally, you couldn't pay me to go back to school unless you were paying off my current set of student loans. That's the you only, know what though? It's a it, it's a heck of a di so to the kind of to the point of the the piece. It's a heck of a differentiator though. So it's a master cert that I'll get in ten months. Okay. Normally it's about a two year program, so it's an accelerated okay. course. Is the reason that we have an exam every weekend. But like, there's so few people uh -huh. like who have the designation in the industry right that it immediately steps you up steps me up and kind of propels me against you know peers in the market mm -hmm. um so it it'll be worth it when it's done sure but the initial cash outlay i think it was like seven grand right. to you know get to start in, get enrolled right but then also the the 10 months of intense studying plus you got to pass a national exam mm -hmm. I'll be glad when it's done. Um, but I'll you be know. glad when it's done for you. <laughs> and what, what, what's the certification for? Uh, the certified official? financial planner. Yeah, okay. Very good. Very good. So Malcolm knows what he's talking about, as we always like to remind people on this show. At least I tell people I do. <laughs> <laughs> and then also uh, the last thing, and probably the least advisable but also necessary, uh, spend money on an experience such as travel, a music lesson, or a class, um, or like an Appalachian looming technique. I don't know what that is. Uh, studies show that exper exp experiential purchases make us happier and longer for a period of time than buying material things, which I can like attest to. Like every time I buy a new set of tennis shoes, I'm like, all right, what's my next set? <laughs> what's my next pair? But people say that that's kind of a, a serious cultural shift, though, for for us, for us really? younger people versus folks Gen Xs and Boomers, uh -huh. is that we seem to care a lot more about experiential type stuff sure. um, than we do having a bunch of stuff. Sure. And I don't know if that only pertains to those foolish people who are willing to live in small containers <laughs> like and live on boats and uh -huh. stuff like that, uh -huh. or if that applies to the general populace, but I, I keep hearing that that's kind of a significant shift. I, I think I know why that is. Why? Back in the day when our parents were old, you knew when they our had- our parents were old? Uh, well, when they were grown people. I guess you're right, because they're old now, <laughs> not then. Uh, but when our parents were coming up, how you showed that you had some money mm -hmm. was like filling your house with like stuff mm -hmm. and saying like, oh, I got the China in the nice right, right, right. chaise lounge. The legitimate furniture that right. I still don't have. Right. Now you show people that you got a little something and that you're doing something by what? Having an experience and posting it on the gram <laughs> on Facebook. So anyway, a uh, little commentary there. Uh, question for you. Do you remember your first tax refund? Actually, I do. Uh, of course you would. I, I remember even, I don't my, even know why I asked that. I remember no, I mean it's strange, but I remember my dad helping me file my taxes from a part time job that had my first job ever okay. was working at this Halloween shop called Halloween Adventure. Okay. And I used to dress up in costumes and pass out flyers in the parking lot <laughs> of the Halloween store. Ah, uh, I see. How and old were you? I don't know, sixteen maybe, fifteen. Okay. Okay. Um and I probably made, let's call it you know, two thousand right. dollars over the course of the two and a half three Halloween that season, I had. right? Basically, right. Um, and I was upset that I had to file taxes in the first place because, like, as far as I was concerned, this was my money. Right? Like, <laughs> why does Uncle Sam need to be concerned with what I got going on? But then I learned that because of how little I made, uh -huh. I was going to end up getting it all back anyway right and then i was a little bit upset that they made me even have the deductions in the first place then right. because if i was going to get it all back why'd you waste my time <laughs> instead of so you know at at 16 uh, i was upset about the u.s tax code <laughs> and the way it's structured <laughs> like 
That's hilarious. Um, I don't. I think I maybe, if I remember correctly, my first tax refund was maybe two hundred fifty dollars. Um, but I more readily remember fi- like doing the paperwork because I did it by hand mm-hmm. in class in Mr. Maloof's senior economics class. <laughs> Mr. Maloof Chuck, sounds like Chuck, an econ teacher. Chuck Maloof, who when I went back from our ten year high school reunion, looked exactly the same as he looked when I was there. He looked like a Maloof. He looked like a Maloof. <laughs> so anyway, uh, he he was an economics teacher, and it was like the one of those things that I never forgot that I learned in his class. Um, I also learned how to balance a checkbook. For- a lot of, course, of good that did you. Of course, we don't have checkbooks anymore. So uh, I've never balanced a checkbook before. <laughs> I don't think anyone in the millennial generation has ever done that. Um, if you had the opportunity, Malcolm, to speak to those who are getting substantial tax refunds, what would you say they should be focused on? With that, um, with that? One, they should be adjusting their withholdings okay. so that they're not getting so much back at the end of uh, the year mm-hmm. versus having it throughout the course of the year. Right. Because I'd much rather have... Uh, my dollars in my pocket in January, February, March, April to uh-huh. do what I want or need to with it right. versus getting it at one time through the year and giving the federal government an interest-free loan. Right. Federal government is never going to me, give me money interest-free. <laughs> so I have no interest in giving it to the federal government. So I actually usually end up offsetting you know what I what I owe. Right. Uh, you know I get it within about a thousand dollars at the end of each year. Okay. But I'd much rather me have to give them a check and they wait on me. Right. Versus me having to wait on the government um, to give me my own money back. I should have right. gotten you know a long time ago. But that's true. It, that, that's that's usually my my issue with folks that are like really excited. And one of my favorite things to do during tax season. Mm-hmm is to ride the metro and listen to people discuss what they're going to do when they get their tax return back. It is the most entertaining conversation to overhear to me. This is someone who's lived in D.C. his whole life. Right. And people, like, just have the most amazing conversations in public on public transportation, like, in general. But the one about when I get my taxes, this is what I'm going to do. That is, like, the most... Dot, dot, dot. Right. And it's always something ridiculous, like, you know, I'm going to get a new dog house uh put in my backyard because uh, you know my dog needs two bedrooms instead of one or so <laughs> it's always something outrageous like that that that's like funny. gets my attention that's funny we want to remind people uh this you're listening and watching manage your damn money with ben and malcolm uh we're talking about things you should and shouldn't do with your tax refund if you're so lucky to get one uh we're gonna take a quick music break in a moment but i want to remind you on the other side of that break uh, we're going to be doing Malcolm's Money Minute, a slightly different style of Malcolm's Money Minute, uh, but Malcolm's Money Minute nonetheless. Uh, we also want to remind you that you can listen to past episodes of the show on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play, and Spotify. Um, of course, we want to remind you, please leave a review on any of those platforms. Let us know how we're doing. That helps us go up in the ratings. Also, if you have a question you want to send us or a conversation or topic you want us to cover, Send it to us, info at managerdamnmoney.com, and you can always catch us on our social media handles. Malcolm, what's yours? Uh, at Malcolm on Money. And, of course, I am at MYDM1, and that's both on Twitter and Legram. Uh, you can also catch us on Facebook.com backslash Manager Damn Money. This is Manager Damn Money with Ben and Malcolm. We will be right back.
Malcolm. I just recently started listening to the podcast Manager Damn Money on Spotify, and I love it, along with following you both on, as I said before, Le Gram. The questions and answers been and in you ask and answer have been beneficial and eye-opening. I am a 29-year-old woman just recently moved to Long Beach, California from Chicago, Illinois. When I was in Chicago, I tried everything I could to save money. I read books. I tried starting a savings account. I talked to a financial advisor, tried talking to friends and family for help. I just can't seem to discipline myself when it comes to saving money, but I'm smart enough to know the benefits of doing so. My issues are I see what I have and I want to spend it. Whether it's shopping, eating out, grabbing a drink, I swipe. It also doesn't help the majority of my friends have higher paying jobs than I do, both in Cali and in Illinois, so my spending is increasingly higher than I'd like when going out. But I love being sociable, especially living somewhere completely new. I know that's an excuse I keep telling myself. If there's any advice you can give, it would be greatly appreciated. Signed, Alexandria. So I think Alexandria already touched on what the issues are and also what the solutions are. So it's really interesting to me. Like as I was reading that and listening to you read it so eloquently. Thank you very much. Uh, in your, your TV voiceover voice. Uh -huh. It's interesting because she touched on discipline, which is like the number one reason that most people like when they go after their uh, financial goals and don't hit it. Right. That's usually the reason why they don't make it is because discipline. Right. Um, but then also the fact that she pointed out that uh, she had an excuse for why she wasn't doing it, which was <laughs> everybody else around me makes more money than me. Right. So I'm not able to save because I'm trying to keep up with the Joneses and ball on a budget. Right. It just doesn't quite match up. Right. right. Like either you want it or you don't. So I think number one. Uh, is just you have to prioritize what's important. Mm -hmm. So you can either have fun with your friends at brunch on Sunday and eat what they eat and order, you know, the most expensive thing on the menu, or you can still go to brunch with your friends and hang out. Maybe you just skip one here and there, right. um, or you only go to one every month or whatever. Um, or also, I've I've read folks do this as part of their like financial plan. Invite other people to your house. That's so true. instead of always going out and paying, you know, forty, fifty dollars, once you include bottomless mimosas, plus tip, plus you know, however much tip, if, mm -hmm. depending on how generous you are, <laughs> you could invite your friends over for mimosas. Everybody bring a bottle of champagne. You buy some orange juice, and you have the same conversation you would have had if you were out anyway. So right. I think you know, she mentioned that she's twenty nine, and you know how I feel about twenty nine versus thirty. <laughs> twenty anything, people always give you an excuse. Right. As soon as you turn. 30 they say what's wrong with you why can't you get it together <laughs> so however many months she has until her 30th birthday uh, I, alexandria live it up because it's coming um and you know because to quote a drake line you know she's still young enough to know better i mean old enough to know better but young enough to not give a what <laughs> um so I, I just say you know once 30 hits folks will not give you that excuse anymore so to the advice piece i would say find yourself an accountability partner um, find yourself somebody who you can tell your situation to. You can have an open, honest dialogue about it. Let them know what you're trying to accomplish, what your financial goal is, your savings goal for that year. And then actually have that person hold you accountable to what you said you were going to do um, when you initially sat down and said, here's what my, my goal is. And then, you know, be willing to be open and honest about it and hold yourself, you know, hold yourself to it. Right, right. And that was another wonderful Malcolm's Money Minute. Malcolm dropping the knowledge. If you have a question that you want Malcolm to respond to, as he so eloquently did to Alexandria, Alexandria, we hope that's helpful for you. Uh, send us your question, info at managerdamnmoney.com. Uh, but as we have been discussing today's conversation at hand, what you should be doing with your tax refund. Um, it's one thing to know what you should be doing with your tax refund, Malcolm. If you listen to this show, you pretty much know what those things are. Let's hope so. Uh, but what are some of the ways you definitely, absolutely, certainly should not be spending your tax refund money? Um, so we pulled a story uh, by Jeff Williams in the U.S. News and World Report. Um, it was written recently in March 2018. Uh, it was a piece covering five things you should not be spending your tax refund on. 
So the number one thing here, Malcolm, is something we've discussed a little bit on this show. Maybe we should do like a whole show on it. I don't know what it would be about. Gambling. <laughs> a staggering 60% of Americans gamble at least once a year, according to the National Council on Problem Gambling. In fact, 1% of the population, or about 2 million people, are considered pathological gamblers, and another 2 to 3%, that's 4 to 6 million people, are problem gamblers. So I think there's like stages of gambling. I wonder what that... Because that's probably a thin line. <laughs> like, the way gambling sucks you in, that's probably a very thin line. It's like right here, you're like problem gambler, and here you're like really got some I'm issues. a social gambler right. versus I'm a problem gambler. It's kind of like, you know, drinking. Like, I'm a right. social drinker I'm versus. A social drinker. I wonder what that threshold is. That's, anyway. That's funny. Uh, but another thing you should not be spending your tax refund on, buying or investing in a big ticket item or a company you can't afford. Don't fall into the trap of promising a friend that you'll invest in his or her company or telling a spouse that you're going to finally use your tax refund for something you can barely afford at a time when you can barely pay all of your bills. That could ultimately lead to taking out a loan on your tax refund. So don't use your tax refund to buy something like a car, like a, uh, what's the car you said you wanted in the past, Malcolm? Uh, Porsche Panamera. No, you said like a BMW. BMW X6? I think that was it. Yeah. So my Tesla Model S? I mean, I could, you know. <laughs> so don't go and put a down payment on one of those expensive cars knowing you can't keep up with the payments in the months following. Um, and also don't invest in a new company because, you know, unless you got it like that, you probably shouldn't be doing that. And if you're getting a refund, you definitely <laughs> you don't have it like that. Uh, so another one, don't invest in cryptocurrency. Using a tax refund to buy some cryptocurrency may seem like a smart decision, especially these days. The dilemma, however, is that you are rolling the dice. Because cryptocurrency is such an untested form of money, expert, if experts advise proceeding with caution. And we've talked about this once before on the show, Malcolm, uh, that cryptocurrency is such so much of an unknown quantity and commodity right now that, you know, for money that you're getting back, you don't necessarily want to dump it into something that's unknown. I mean, beyond that, though, just... You know my rule, don't invest in anything you don't actually understand. Mm -hmm. And cryptocurrency is one of those things that like 99.75% of the American population does not really understand. Right. Uh, and then the last one, using the money as a down payment. I guess you could in certain scenarios as in terms of stacking, right? But not necessarily all in one go or at least in just that simple one-time re refund. Right. Uh, putting it down on a house, car, Motor, motorcycle or boat um ideally if you're doing any of those kinds of things you should have been saving on the way to saving for it for a while right um and definitely need to check your ability to afford it after the fact and i think that kind of goes with the point you made before about spending the money toward things that cause you to spend more money right like a house is one of those things where if this is your down payment right then you've also got to check that budget to say, <laughs> can I even afford the first mo mortgage payment, right. you know, once once I close? Right, right, right. Um, so one of the things that people might get lulled into getting a tax refund is to buy something expensive or to, quote, unquote, treat themselves. Right. Um, you manage the portfolios of people who have a good amount of money. Um, but what they don't necessarily get tax refunds, Right. But what are some things that people who have portfolios that someone like you would manage, what are things they might spend money on that they maybe shouldn't be spending money on? Like, what are the most ridiculous purchases purchases you've seen when Joe got right. $20,000? He was just like, you know what? I'm going to go do. You know what? But <laughs> believe it or not, we touched on two of them. Okay. I've had people talk to me about gambling. Right. Oh, wow. Um, And I had somebody say two words that, like, grind my gears and drive me crazy which was it's free money <laughs> there is no such thing under the sun as right. free money uh -huh. right it's we already identified it's your money you worked for it you earned it right it's just that the government had custody of it for 11 and a half months out of the year and now you get it back uh -huh. um but then also um a lot of times it's i want to invest in this person's project mm. or this person's business or even my own you know idea or right. business that I have, which I, I think is a little bit better than I want to invest in, you know, my friend or my neighbor's or business. Poopy. They want to, you know, something that's kind of off the cuff yeah. that you wouldn't under normal circumstances be willing to hear them out. Right. Why now? Like right. why all of a sudden? Because you got the extra money. It, but it's, that's the thing though. It's not extra money. It's your money. Right. Um, but there's a concept 
in econ. Uh, you know, I don't, what was your teacher's name? Mr. Mr. Malouf. Uh, Mr. Malouf. Charles if Mr. Malouf. Malouf is listening, he'll appreciate this. Uh, There's a concept in e- economics uh, called uh, mental accounting, where yeah. basically you treat one pile of money different from another pile of money. Okay. So because this $10,000 that's in my savings account took me all year to save because it was money from my, my paycheck, and this $10,000 that's, you know, my tax return, didn't take me all year to save it, just all of a sudden came to me, right. it's a lot easier for me to part with this $10,000 than sure. it was the one that I, I worked harder for. So that's usually what happens is people look at that and go, oh, that's free money. Right. It's all the same. Every dollar equals the same thing. It's fungible. So it's just interesting that that's how people uh, perceive tax refund money and inheritances also. I just realized why you have suddenly all these facts and these words that you're dropping on the show. Wow. It's because you're in school and you got flashcards on the show. <laughs> and you're just dropping us what's on your test on Saturday. No, that's. I wish if this test was on econ, I would have passed like six years ago. Okay. I'd have no reason to be in school studying for it. Okay. I wish there were econ questions. Well, uh, before we wrap up the show, uh, what would you say as a quick reminder, when people get money, whether it's through a tax refund or some other mechanism of a like slight or even large windfall, what are like the three things that people need to be ticking off to make sure they're doing before they do anything? Um, probably sit on it for a little while. Mm-hmm. Like allow your emotions to subside, the excitement to subside a right. little bit, and really decide if this is something you want to be doing. So right. let a few months pass before you decide that you want to do it. Also, don't tell anybody that you have it. Yeah. Like everybody doesn't need to know that you all of a sudden came into five, ten thousand dollars because they will figure out something for you to spend it on. Girl! <laughs> and then also, um, if you don't have, as we mentioned earlier on in the show, if you don't already have that emergency savings fund um, that'll cover the next six months of your monthly expenses, that's an awesome place to put it right. to at least get started if that doesn't cover the whole thing. Right. Um, until you have that six months you know, put to the side where you know you can run to it as fast as you need to, right. everything else can wait. Right, absolutely. That's some good stuff, Malcolm. Uh, well, as we close the show, I want to remind people you can always catch past episodes of Manager Damn Money with Ben and Malcolm on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play, and Spotify. And, of course, please, please, please leave us a review on any of those platforms. That help us helps us go up in the ratings and helps other people find and listen and watch our show. Um, and, of course, if you have a question that you'd like Malcolm to respond to, uh, please send it to us, info at com. You can also catch us on Twitter or Le Graham. Malcolm, what's your handle? Uh, at Malcolm on Money. And, of course, the handle for myself and for the show is at MYDM1. Uh, and you can catch us also on Facebook, facebook.com backslash manager damn money. Uh, we'd like to thank our partners and our crew here at Montgomery Community Media. Um, another wonderful show as always. Until the next time, I'd like to remind you to be good with your money. Peace. Peace. <laughs>